What's going on guys? Welcome back to Consuming Crime with Jen and Jules. It is Jules here this week. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the Netflix documentary Murder to Mercy, the Centoya Brown story. This documentary is an hour and a half long, so I'm going to cover the first 45 minutes, which is basically the murder and the conviction part, and then next week is going to be part two where we cover the mercy part. Before we get started, though, make sure you give us five stars wherever you're listening. Be sure to check out consumingcrime.com as well. I've been doing really good about making sure that is up to date. Also, if you're not already, make sure you check out our Patreon. We have a $5 tier, which gets you two bonus episodes a month, which gets you a total of six a month. $7 gets you the two bonus episodes plus all of our regular episodes ad-free. The $12 tier gets you all of that plus you get to watch me in my ghetto studio tell stories yeah but check it out guys oh by the way on the patreon we are covering aaron hernandez so if you go over there you'll be able to hear parts one and two three is not up yet and yeah without further ado let's get into it i want you to start with the night of august 6 2004 i was with cut the pimp he said that i needed to get some money this defendant shot johnny out in the head, in his bed, but gives a wild theory of how it was self-defense. I shot him because I thought he was going to shoot me. We, the jury, find the defendant, Centoya Denise Brown, guilty first-degree murder. If you are a juvenile and you're convicted in Tennessee of first-degree murder, the only two options are either true life without parole or 51 years. Hey, Mommy. Well, I got ice. Outside of the glass and the bars, we may never be like a mother and a daughter should be. Here's a kid who didn't have a chance. She didn't have a chance before she was born. I got pregnant on my 16th birthday. I drank and I was introduced to crack cocaine. My mother, we didn't live in a very, very stable home. They came from genetics and the genetics should stop. Centoya Brown, in prison for more than a decade now. Her case is catching fire on social media. Centoya made the decision to seek the help of the governor and petition for clemency. In 2004, she was considered a prostitute. Today, she would be considered a victim of sexual predators. She has made the most amazing transformation I have come such a long way. It's been a very long time. When I was 16, I did a horrible thing. And I have carried that with me this whole time. I know that your decision is very serious. I do pray that you show me mercy and that you give me a second chance. Okay, so you guys saw from that pretty much the kind of the gist and summary of what we're going to get into today. And overall, it's about a young girl who... From, you could, from what you could tell, was convicted of first-degree murder. And eventually, we're wondering, was it justified? Was she tried fairly? And we're going to get into the details today, where I can ask you guys if you think she was treated fairly, and then I will give opinions of my own. Some maybe you won't agree with, some maybe you will, but I like this podcast too. I like to be able to, you know, speak my mind, of course, with the respect of others. So let's let's get into the story. So on September 1st, 2004, Centoya Brown is 16 years old in juvenile detention. At this point, she has been in jail for three weeks. This is in Davidson County Juvenile Jail, Nashville, Tennessee. She is charged with homicide, robbery, weapon possession, and criminal impersonation. And by charged, I think they meant like this, these are the charges she was facing. So she hasn't yet been found guilty of this in the documentary yet. So it starts off interviewing her and she talks about how she feels sad. She feels like she has no one. She doesn't have a lot of faith in herself. And from already talking to her, you can see that her background, she doesn't have a lot of support. She doesn't have a lot of people to go to. She just kind of seems like a girl taking things day by day and she you could tell she trusts nobody and this is not to excuse her later action but it is to give a background on why she does the things that she does 
So this crime that we're talking about was committed on August 6, 2004, and she was arrested two days later on the 8th. The state initially wanted to transfer her to adult jail because all 50 states have laws on charging juveniles as adults if they committed a serious crime. In Tennessee, they happen to have the harshest minimum punishment for first-degree murder. And this was 60 years with the possibility of parole after 51 years. Also, if you're 16 years of age or older, any type of crime can be transferred even if it's a smaller one. This one attorney accounts that there was a 12-year-old that was transferred for homicide. Now you're kind of like, what kind of state is Tennessee where a 12-year-old was transferred for homicide? Like, I want to hear that story. Dr. Burnett and Dr. Walker are the names of the psychologists that are going to be on the case from start to finish. We get into an interview with Dr. Burnett and Santoya Brown, and they start talking about the family. Like, who's your mother? And she goes, Elinette Brown is my mother, oh, adoptive mother. And Georgina Mitchell would be her biological mother. But her biological mother had her for a couple of months and then gave eventually ended up giving her to Elinette to adopt her. They asked her, how old was your mother when she had you? And she said she was 16, which means she is now 32. The psychologist asked her, you know, how does it feel, you know, when you were, when your mom was this age, she was having you. And Santoya was like, like, didn't really have a reaction. You could tell she has no relationship with her biological mother. What I liked about Santoya is she's very honest in the fact that, you know, I feel like most teenagers, when you accuse them of being angry, they get defensive. And when he asked her about the mood swings, she said, yeah, I have them. I get angry and I get sad and then I get happy and then I get angry and I get sad and then I get happy. And he asked her, how often do you feel happy? And she goes, it's very, very rare. And she just looked kind of like she wanted to give up, but not in a suicidal way, just in like a, a like I'm tired type of way. So now Dr. Walker comes in and he does a psych evaluation and he conducts a test called the Roberts Apperception Test. In this test, they show you images and you have to come up with a story from those images. So for her, all of her stories were chaotic, distrusting, and they did not have a resolution. One of them, she said, in this picture, she killed a little girl and she's ashamed of it, and she's just realizing what she's done. Another picture, this couple was arguing, and now he's forcing her to kiss him, and she doesn't want to. Another one, they're arguing about money, and they're mad at her because uh, they used her only because she's black, so they could get what they want from her. So just from this, you can kind of see like, okay, yeah, no, this girl does not trust people, period. And we'll get into why that matters in regards to the case and the crime later on. The psychologist comes back to the attorney and his recommendation for her is that she stays in the juvenile system till she's 19. During that time, she rehabilitates psychologically and after that, she should be released. And that's optimistic to say the least considering this is Tennessee. Centoya Brown is a young black woman and she's not wealthy either so all spoiler alert that's not what happens on november 3rd 2004 this is the day before her transfer hearing she's been incarcerated two months right now we are in the interview room with the attorneys and we have georgina mitchell and elinette brown remember elinette is the adoptive mother and georgina is the biological mother it was a little tense like, if you read the room, it was a little awkward, you can tell, between the two mothers, but I think there was overall, like, a good level of respect, which is good. And also from the looks, you could tell Elinette is very well put together, she's very professional in the way she presents herself, and even in the way that she speaks. And with Georgina, immediately, you can kind of tell that she's a little bit rougher around the edges, maybe? Maybe in the same way of where she she doesn't trust many people. But if you remember, Sintoya didn't really grow up with her biological mother. So it's almost like they they have that similar trait and yet she wasn't raised by her. So Georgina, or we'll call her Gina, starts talking about mental disorders in the family. She says that her own mother shot herself in the stomach when Gina was only in the second grade 
and I guess she saw it, which is traumatizing. And then Gina's grandmother shot herself in the chest and she died instantly. And they were all drunks, they all had mental issues, they all had suicidal issues. According to Gina, it's genetics, and you're gonna hear the word genetics a lot. Whether you agree with it or not, I gotta report on the facts. I don't know, I'm not educated enough to say if things like, you know, depression and anxiety and schizophrenia, those things do run in the family, it's proven, but as far as this linking to her committing a crime and murdering somebody, we'll talk about that later. So Gina had Centoya on and off since she was about six months old and Elinette took over in the off periods. So Elinette was kind of always around Centoya, she just wasn't always adopting her. Then Centoya turned two and Elinette adopted her officially and immediately, like the, the, the older Centoya got, the more she would run away, the more she didn't want any structure. No matter how good her home life was, she just didn't want to be told what to do. She wanted to do drugs whenever she wanted. She wanted to hook up with whoever she wanted and she wouldn't go to school. And it caused a lot of grief for Elinette who loves her regardless of the fact that she's not her blood mother. Gina, of course, says it's a trait thing. It's a genetics thing. Genetically, we don't want to be told what to do. I don't know if that runs in the family, but I guess, may I don't know, maybe, because I do what I want, and my mom is very, I do what I want too, so maybe the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. But then again, I was raised by my mother. Centoya was not raised by Gina, which raises the question, where did you get this from? On November 4th, 2004, this is the transfer hearing. So this isn't to determine if she's guilty or not guilty. This is just to figure out whether or not she's going to be heard as an adult. What is, what I notice is weird about this is at her transfer hearing, that's when Centoya initially talks about what happened the night of August 6th. So I'm gonna get into that right now. This is on Centoya's account. Really quick, you guys, I interrupt this program to introduce you to today's sponsor. It is Consuming Crime's very first sponsor, and that is Audible.com, which is an Amazon-owned company. They are the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers to celebrity memoirs, news, business, and self-development. Every month, you get one free credit, and with our code, Consuming Crime, you can get one month free and one free audiobook. I actually use Audible myself. I don't really have time to sit down and read a book. I'm constantly moving around and, you know, doing school, work, the podcast, things like that. Right now, I am currently reading a book written by Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. I love a lot of his works, and the one I'm reading right now is called The Mastery of Self. I am obsessed with self-development, self-growth, and this book really teaches you about knowing who you are, knowing, you know, what you have to offer the world, and just knowing that, you know, no one's better than anyone ever, and I think it's really good to just be self-aware. With that being said, again, go on and head over to audibletrial.com slash consumingcrime and get your free audiobook on us completely. Again, that is audibletrial.com slash consumingcrime. Now, back to the story. It was around 7 p.m., she was in the hotel room with Garion, who was also known as Cut or Cutthroat. Garion or Cut was a guy that she was dating and later turned pimp. At the time, she says she did not realize he was pimping her out, but now, looking back on it, she realizes, yeah, he was more of a pimp than a boyfriend. Attorney asked her, you know, what were you guys doing in the hotel room? And she said, what we always did. We smoked weed and had sex all the time. That's all we did. And then one day, which was on this day, he said, you know what, you need to get off your ass, you need to stop slouching, go out there and make some money. So, that's what she did. So she went to East Nashville, not to see anyone in particular, but because she knew that this was a spot that they had prostitutes, and that was her intention. She went to a Sonic over there, and a man pulled over in a white truck and asked her if she needed a ride. She said yes. And he asked her if she wanted to get into some action, obviously talking about sex, and he goes, how much? And she says, 200, and he's like, no, 100. And he goes, they both agree on 150. 
which makes me sad because remember she's telling a story to a jury and her mom who is Elinette her adoptive mother but I'm gonna say her mom and I don't know as a parent I don't know you don't want to hear that but she wanted to go to a hotel he wanted to go to his house the reason is because there's nobody at his house and he lives alone so already to somebody who is a little bit maybe paranoid and doesn't trust people that's a little sus it's a little suspicious he talked about himself he was a real estate agent very important in the community he said he was in the army he told her that she he was a sharpshooter another like mm, he was talking about women and how women only want him for his money and so kind of a little bit spiteful towards women just a little bit not hateful just a little comment he also wanted to be made love to with desire remember she's 16 years old and he's 42. you guys can i'm i'm, I'm terrible at hiding my facial expression so if you're the vip i think you might already be able to see how not okay with the situation i am once they get to his house he shows her his guns and there's they're like hunting rifles shotguns type of things and right now she gets reminded of cut who's her boyfriend or pimp i don't know and she got nervous she started shaking a little bit and she normally does not go to people's houses which i believe her she normally prostitutes she did admit to doing that she said that she only would do it in hotel rooms and she never went back to people's houses she says can we go downstairs and watch tv he goes yeah let's watch tv so they go downstairs watch tv and she wanted to make sure she stayed close to the door that was her fear and then she had a plan she said okay what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna like you know oh let's take a nap let's let's sleep a little bit and while he's asleep she was her intention was to leave while he was sleeping so she starts saying how she was afraid of the way he was acting and she starts getting in her own head he's a really important guy he's known in the community he makes a lot of money who the hell am i nobody knows where i am cut doesn't even know where i am my family doesn't know where i am if i disappear nobody's gonna notice so she gets in her own head about that so they're laying in bed and she's pretending to be asleep and he kind of keeps touching her like oh like it's time like let's bang let's do it and then she's like oh, like i'm sleeping no and eventually i guess he grabs her relatively hard and she like jerks back like i think with maybe the same strength and was like mm, like i'm sleeping <laughs> according to her he had made this really mean face at her and it was almost like evil so when he turned around to face the other side of the bed in her mind she thought that he was gonna grab a gun so she turns around first grabs a gun turns back around he's still facing the other way and shoots him killing him instantly i am curious if you guys are able to comment right now before we continue so far what you think if she's justified or if you need to know more okay so now we have this guy in the courtroom jeff burks he is the assistant da of tennessee jeff burks you're gonna hear him a lot he's like the main guy that goes up against centoya brown and he starts accusing her and saying things like if you weren't comfortable you got in the car you went into his bed like if you were so scared why did you do all those things i think this is the part that i think I have the strongest opinion of but it could also be wildly controversial so what i will say and i'm gonna tread lightly here you never know what you're gonna do when you're afraid you never know it's not fight or flight it's actually fight flight or freeze there's three of them but i'm not trying to justify her killing him at all I have a separate opinion on that. It's just this Jeff Burks guy. I just don't like him. Okay, let me continue before I piss off a lot of people. <laughs> but also, she took his wallet and his truck, which makes her motives seem very wishy-washy. And I can understand this from a jury's point of view. From my point of view, she was scared. She killed the guy and well his wallet's here so are his keys i'm gonna dip but it does kind of 
there is a, an area where it looks like she went to him to steal from him. So two weeks later, the judge decides to transfer her to an adult hearing. Fast forward to March 24th, 2005. Santoya is now 17 years old and she has been incarcerated for seven months. Already, just from the way she's speaking in the interview, you could tell she sounds, she's speaking more intelligently, she's speaking more confidently. And right now, she needs a new legal team for her criminal hearing. Fast forward again to July 20th, 2005. The attorneys are now strategizing on the trial. Wendy Tucker is her newest defense attorney, and Burnett and Walker, the psychologists, are still working on the case. And now they have to find a different a different way because before they were only trying to prove that she was young and she needed to stay in juvenile court but now they have to prove either that she's insane or that it wasn't premeditated so she can at least get second degree they start having this conversation about miranda rights and how your person the person you're arresting needs to understand without a shadow of a doubt what their miranda rights mean and statistically, in the United States, 90% of juveniles do not understand the Miranda rights as they are read to them. Right now, though, they're, they're very much trying to say that Centoya didn't understand her Miranda rights, and one of the officers was saying, oh, if you cooperate with us, I'll talk to the DA, which we all know can be a play on words. Like, they're maybe just talk about coffee, but he doesn't actually mean he's going to swing you a deal. But... He's talking to a juvenile, so of course, that's what she's going to think, which is unfortunate, but at the end of the day, there are different interrogating techniques that officers can legally use, and lying is one of them. Officers can say, your DNA was here when it wasn't, just to solicit a confession. That is something they're allowed to do. Also, in the videotape of them explaining the Miranda rights to her, I think they were as clear as they legally needed to be. I don't think that it's part of their job to sit there and line out what right to remain silent means you can be quiet if you want to. Like, this is the one t one time where I'm a little bit like, okay, now you guys are stretching because the Miranda rights were fine. It's not an officer's job to make sure you know what silent means in the dictionary. The cops tricked her and morally, ethically, it's unfortunate, but legally, there's nothing wrong with it. On August 21st, 2006, Centoya is now 18 years old and this is the morning of her trial. She has been incarcerated for two years. So in this interview with her, she talks about how she's not an adult yet, she was reckless at the time, and she does seem like she has remorse about the situation. She does seem like if she were in the situation now, she would have handled it differently. But unfortunately, it doesn't matter. So we have that same attorney from earlier, Jeff Burks, talking now to the jury. He talks about Johnny Allen. He says he was a realty agent and when he died, his hands were in this position. If you can't see it, they're basically, I'm like holding my own hand. And according to the medical examiner, this is the position he died in. She didn't move the body. She just shot him and that's how he was laying. So it's clear to the jury that he was not reaching for a gun and he was in fact in a relaxed position. Arguing self-defense is probably not a good route for the defense because he was chilling when he died. So the defense comes up with their argument and they say, Centoya is a runaway, she has issues, she was living with a 24-year-old boy who beat her, pimped her out, and she was scared and she was paranoid and she was on edge, she didn't trust anybody, and she chose safety over everything not guilty she cannot be guilty on all charges while in some ways i agree with the defense if i was a juror on that stand it would not be looking good for centoya just from the fact that this picture you guys this picture i i wonder if i can if i can pull it up i'll put it right here for my patrons but it looked like he was sleeping and i really genuinely believe in my heart and my soul that centoya was scared and that she really thought he was going to shoot her. But I don't know how I would try her. I don't know if I would give her self-defense. I know for sure I wouldn't give her first degree. But I don't think I would let it off as easy as second degree. I'm trying to understand her. But it looks really bad. So the attorneys do question the detectives about 
the Miranda rights and about swinging her a deal possibly. And this doesn't get anywhere because whether or not she understood her Miranda rights, if you're in the jury, you have it in your head that this dude was sleeping when she shot him. So I think after this, I think she lost the jury. What makes it even worse is there's a phone call played for everyone between Elinette and Centoya, and Centoya makes the comment, I killed him, I executed him. And when you say you executed, just saying those words kind of insinuates you have no remorse about the situation. So it's, it's just, it's not looking good. You have her other defense attorney come forward and says, by day he went to church, and there were times where he was not that man. He is a 43 year old, he picks up a young girl, so young that the waitress at Sonic thought that she was his niece or his daughter. And she's just, you know, he's not saying Centoy is an angel, but what he's trying to say is she's a 16 year old runaway, she's trying her best, and there's no way she's guilty of these charges. So the jury deliberates. Six hours later, they have their verdict which usually means if it wasn't just six hours, it was unanimous. They come forward and they find her guilty on first degree murder, felony murder, and aggravated robbery. She is officially sentenced to life in prison and they go to a phone call between her and her mother where they're on the phone and they're talking about, yeah, I got life in prison, but she's, she's very positive. She goes, mom, my life isn't over. It's just gonna be in a different setting. I'm still gonna grow old. You're still gonna be able to see me and this and this and that. Like, I don't want you to stress out. I just want you to be okay. Like, it's very sweet and you can tell that, and I think she knew she was gonna get found guilty, but it, it, I'm glad that she's being positive about it. It is now May 27th, 2008 in Phoenix City, Arizona. And right now, the documentary went to interview Georgina, which is the biological mother. She accounts being pregnant on her 16th birthday. Her mother was extremely unstable, which we talked about a little bit earlier. And she would go out and get attention from friends and men, just wherever she could get it. She would even drink vodka from her mom's cabinet, because her mother was a drunk, like we mentioned. And during her entire pregnancy, she drank alcohol. And during the last month of her pregnancy, she was introduced to crack cocaine. So, from the very get-go, Centoya <laughs> suffered. She suffered. I mean, I don't know, just drinking a whole bottle of alcohol while you're pregnant? Like, so after that, she prostituted, she was raped, she had guns to her head, she was robbed, everything. Basically everywhere that Centoya was leading to. So in a way, I am happy that Centoya was arrested because I think it would have led her to a better path, but I do not agree with the sentencing, not in the slightest. So we're now talking to Joanne Warren, who is Gina's mom, or Centoya's grandmother. Everyone was taking medication, everyone has the same psychological issues, it's genetics, it's inevitable, you're screwed from the moment you're born. I don't know, I mean, you definitely can't say oh yeah, I shot somebody, but it's okay, because genetics, like, my dad shot somebody too, <laughs> like, that's not an argument, you can't use it legally, so, but that's, that's what they say. That's the end of what I'm going to talk about today. That's the conviction, that's the murder charge, and next week we're going to go over the mercy, where how does this girl go from life in prison to essentially freedom? And we're gonna get we're gonna get into that next week. Make sure you give us five stars wherever you're listening. And if you're not already, check us out on Patreon. Remember, we have three tiers. Five dollars gets you two bonus episodes. Seven dollars gets you that plus ad free of the regular feed. Twelve dollars gets you all of that plus you can watch me tell the stories instead of just hear me tell the stories. But I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. Thank you guys for consuming crime with me today. I will you will hear me next week.